Good evening, good evening. How you guys doing? All right. Well, welcome to the inaugural A-List Presents Rethinking the Marketplace. Right. For those who don't know us, I'm Dr. Mitch Hamilton. This is Dr. Julian St. Clair. And just real quick, the Rethinking the Marketplace event is an annual event where we want to honor and, and share light and highlight industry leaders who have found success through unconventional approaches, non-traditional approaches. All right, so this will be an annual thing where we hope to have this great turnout every year. All right? For those of you who don't know, the A-List program is also a very new program within the marketing department where we specialize and we focus on positive societal transformation through marketing. In other words, what we're hoping to achieve is the triple bottom line approach where you increase profits, you have a positive impact on people, and you have a positive impact on the planet. And we're hoping to do that through marketing. And what we believe is that that's actually the best approach. That's actually the most profitable approach to business. All right? So not only do we invite guests that, <laughs> not only are our guests um, unconventional and non-traditional, we try to take non-traditional approaches in the classroom as well. So one of the things that we kind of administer in our classroom is this idea of the flipped classroom approach, where a lot of the things that you used to do in class, we can now videotape and simulate. You can watch that content outside of class, and then you can come to class, and then that day is kind of like a lab where there's a lot of hands-on learning, and we can kind of have an experiential learning project right there in class and learn through reflection. All right, so for example, with our business case studies, how many of you have ever used a business case study in your class? So of you that are raising your hand, how many of you guys like it when your professor assigns you to read the case, you read the case, you answer questions, and then you come back to class and you have this very long discussion about the case? Who likes that? Uh, 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 a couple people, right? Well, what we're saying is that if you want to increase engagement in the classroom, you can use this flipped classroom approach where we simulate those case study discussions and those lecture discussions. But because we're the A-list, right, we kind of, we took it up another notch. So what we did is when we simulated our case study discussions, we actually hired a film crew to produce an actual film, a short film, where we kind of, um, we made a, a sitcom parody, so to speak. So we played off the shows like Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Anybody remember Fresh Prince of Bel-Air? Yeah. Saved by the Bell and things like that. To where we have a, an actual scripted case study discussion where it covers all the topics and all the perspectives you would have gotten if you would have came to class. So that allows you to watch that, get all those perspectives, answer your questions, come to class, and then now we can have hands-on learning. So what we're going to show you today is we're not going to show you the long, short film. But we, what we did do is we also, as a way to kind of promote this new idea in the A-list, is that we recreated kind of the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air theme song. Who remembers in the beginning? Now this is the story and all that stuff. It's actually embarrassing having Nipsey here that we're about to show you. <laughs> but uh, so we'll show you a little, a little sample of kind of things that we do in the A-list. Sorry about that. Nancy. Oh, sorry. So just to give you a heads up, there's a lot of cameos. We're going to have some of your classmates. We're going to have a guest cameo. Wait till you see what our, now, after you see what our dean does, you're going to tell everybody we have the downest dean you ever see. Guaranteed. <laughs> and I also got my kids and my wife in there, too. Yeah, wait till you see, wait till you see Dean Smith in this. Groups based on common characteristics. This is called. Anyone? And when Abercrombie and Fitch decides to strategically divide their audience into distinct groups based on common characteristics, this is called. Anyone? Anyone? This is called market segmentation. Okay. Dr. Mitch and 
a phone at the college of business for the staff and the students to acknowledge and witness. You ask who I am and they probably answer with, he's the handsomest man of all the Los Angeles campuses. No sugar phone, it's the people that voted. Now I'm the most noted symposium host at the podium. So folks listen close to the tale that I'm telling you. This is how I became the freshest professor at LMU. <laughs> So that, that was, of course, tons of fun to make, uh, a long day, but a, a very fun day. Again, in between the when he goes to sleep and when he wakes up, there's actually like some content there for students to learn from, whereas the simulated case discussion was still done in a way that's going to be hopefully hopefully entertaining. Um, I'm uh, Dr. Julian St. Clair. I'm, I'm working with, with Mitch Hamilton on A-List and other projects. We do have two very special guests that we're going to bring up in just a moment but to kind of preface that and provide... Um, kind of a, a primer on what we're gonna be talking about. We have another video that's pretty short that we're gonna show you uh, that should set the stage. I'm actually having to work three jobs and my husband works three jobs as well and we're still not able to get ahead. Back when I was a kid, my father worked, my mother stayed home, my father's income was enough for us as well. When I was growing up, it was achievable to white picket fans, being able to own your own. Home. I feel like we can never catch up. It's like Stuff. You got to get the millionaires and the billionaires in Washington to start worrying about the working class people. The biggest threat to us as a nation is income inequality. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, nearly one third of working families don't earn enough to make ends meet. Most American workers are able to find jobs, but those jobs are often low paying. The real problem is there's no middle class, right? So the, the gap between the have and have not. It's getting wider and wider. I believe this is the defining challenge of our time. And the thing is, income inequality affects everyone. It can actually hinder overall growth. That we really? have more inequality than any other advanced industrial country. And it's based very much, I think, on, uh, on educational differences. Education alone is so poor if you grow up in the inner city compared to the suburbs. Not true that education is equal in this country because there's still very intense segregation happening. When I say that out loud, 50% of inner city school kids do not graduate high school, that is a national catastrophe. The top 10 best paying college majors are all STEM fields, and nine of the 10 are types of engineering. The innovations and creativity in science, engineering, technology, and math will be the drivers of tomorrow's economy. Jobs, 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 jobs. Jobs. If you are not a participant on that frontier, you will trail behind it and possibly get left behind in time. Low-income students are at a huge disadvantage. They don't have typing classes, let alone computer science classes. And if we really want our students to be ready for the 21st century, we have to be teaching them this content. Companies from Caterpillar to Google are on the hunt for engineers. With 9% unemployment and companies desperate to hire engineers, you'd think undergrads would be lining up to major in the sciences. Poverty. Rejection, horrible education. That we have reached a tipping point here where there are so few people controlling so much wealth that everybody else is struggling to pay for education, for any kind of economic mobility, for job training, for changing jobs, anything like that. And the fear is if you don't do something about it, it becomes permanent wolf and we have a world of a whole lot of have nots and only a few haves. So that video is going to provide a little bit of context and we'll kind of start there to set the stage. I'm going to go ahead and introduce our two very special guests. 
We have private equity investor who made his way through business and real estate and social entrepreneur, David Gross, as well as... I was thinking we would just do a big clap at the end, but we could do that too. We also have executive artist, entrepreneur, Nipsey Hussle. What's up, y'all? What's the deal? Yeah. yeah. Awesome video, man. Awesome video. Can you can you kind of provide a little context, a little motivation behind that video? Yeah, for sure. Um, when I first started telling people about Vector 90, like sharing the concept and showing them the deck, you know, it words on paper didn't have the same. It didn't have the emotional impact or the sense of urgency that I needed when I was explaining what I wanted to do. Um, so I actually had our creative directors right there, Elmo. Um, Elmo, uh, what's up, Elmo? <laughs> so I was like, we need to take this deck and turn it into like a piece that people will feel and like something that's very own message. Um, and I think that's a pretty accurate reflection of the impetus behind Vector 90. Like, um, we're in a very precarious situation in this country where you have a small fraction of the economy that can generate obscene wealth, and there's a larger and growing group of people that struggle to get earn a livable wage. Um, and that's dangerous if it goes unchecked. Um, and I don't think that sentiment is controversial. I think a lot of people accept that inequality is a real issue. Um, you might get pushed back on the next piece of this, which is you know, the way that people in this video, and it was across demographics, they feel, you know, there are populations in this country that have always felt that. Um, you go to any inner city around this country, they felt that sense of hopelessness, helplessness, essentially feel like they've played with an unfair hand their entire lives. Um, my concern is that as this becomes an increasing problem in this country, there won't be the political will or the resources to address it in these communities that were left behind from jump. Um, so Vector 90 is a solution to kind of address some of these gaps and opportunity and exposure and access to the things that lead to income inequality. Dave, can you expand a little bit more on what Vector 90 is? Where is it? What's its mission? What does it do? Yeah, I think it's easy in a classroom like this because I'm pretty sure everyone here knows what WeWork is. Um, WeWork is a co-working community, shared office spaces. You know, they try to create like a vibe to get people to collaborate and work together and, and form, forge relationships in the business world. So Vector 90 is that, but in the inner city. And because our mission is a little bit deeper, um, you know, we're starting with people who didn't have the inputs, you know, at an early stage in their lives or, or business careers. You know, there's some additional educational and, and vocational training and curriculum that we're providing, in addition to providing like a, a beautiful co-working space. So if you come and check out our space, um, you'll see that the level of aesthetic quality, the resources, the tools we provide our entrepreneurs, it matches. You know, I worked out of WeWork work in Santa Monica. It matches that. So it's a co-working community. It's an incubator space. Um, and I think a lot of people have laughed on to the fact that we're going to have a STEM center for neighborhood kids, you know, once we're fully operational um, and, and the business model is robust. <clears throat> How did the partnership between the two of you develop? Uh, go ahead. No, no, I'll let you tell the story. Nah, yeah. So I met Dave, just, we was sitting next to each other at the, at the Lego game on a random. And uh, <clears throat> when I tell a story, I always use this uh, example. The first two quarters, me and Dave didn't really say nothing. We sitting this distance from each other. He got his wife with him. I got um, one of my people with me. And then we start taking tequila shots. So by the third quarter, we're both a little, a little you know, uh, intoxicated. Or just in a, in, a, in a more social vibe, you know? So we just like end up talking. He like, yeah, Nick, what's up, man? You know, uh, good to meet you on Dave. You know, I do a few things. One of the things I do is I'm a real estate developer. I have this concept and 
I think you'd be a perfect partner. So we started talking about it um, briefly. And he's like, you know, I got an office in Calabasas. Can you come through? I said, yeah, I'll come by tomorrow. And um, when I got there, he had a deck. And the deck was describing Vector 90. It was the concept for it. And um, as he's showing me the paperwork and everything, he's just uh, articulating the vision. It just made sense to me. You know, it wasn't a whole lot of science that uh, I was well versed on. Just the idea made sense that you got underserved areas that have um, tons of potential creatives and Im important. Well, let me say this this way: people with important contributions to make that have either a lack of access, a lack of resources, a lack of support, or just a lack of direction. And I knew that from my own experience, that I was always, um, I had tons of potential, I had tons of ambition, but I just got frustrated for, I, I don't know where to go with this, I don't know what's the first step, what direction should I go in? And I, I was one of the fortunate ones that, you know, uh, things lined up for me. And certain people came into my life, certain things happened that allowed me to pursue my passion, which was music, entrepreneurship. But it was a window when it was really critical for me. And it could have went either way. And so I automatically empathized with the mission because I was somebody that, you know, one of my first studios was a, a free community studio in Watts. And I used to catch the bus to the Blue Line spend two or three hours on public transportation to get to this free studio to record for an hour. And that planted the seed early and gave me just a little bit of extra, it made it tangible. It was, it was 60 minutes a, a week I could record, but I knew I had a little spark that I could pour some gas on because of this program. And so I, I was just, I related to the mission. And then over knowing Dave from that day forward and seeing how he was moving toward, you know, building the vision. It came together quick. The, we, we talked about location. Um, you know, I grew up in the Crenshaw district in LA, so. That's right, I see a couple of Crenshaw shirts in here. But, you know, Dave also, you know, has roots in, in South Central Los Angeles himself, you know, so. The big, vi the big picture vision, I'm, I don't know if I'm being long with it, but. Yeah, I keep this. All right, cool, so. The big, the big picture. The big picture concept was to have a network of these Vector 90 centers. And, you know, they would be based in the inner city across America, different inner cities where the number one, I think it's called the Opportunity Zone. Yeah. That's one of the other concepts behind it where it's an underserved area from an investment standpoint. You know, it's not a lot of investment being made over here in development. So there's a level of conscious capitalism going on too because you can offer lower rent space for these for these office spaces because nobody's developing these uh, abandoned buildings or these rundown spots that has just been given up on. And then also you offering a resource in these areas where there's not too many resources. So we looked in, in my neighborhood, we found uh, a unit Dave's team was really proactive, found the 5,000 square foot compound. It used to be a Wonder Bread factory and we walked the location, looked at it. A couple weeks later, that was breaking ground, started building. And in February of this year, 2018, on the 15th, right? My album came out the 16th, the day before my album came out. Yeah, that's how I marked time. that. Yeah. yeah, go get that too, by the way. That's right. Nah, but so the 15th, the compound was built. Everything was ready. It was a grand opening. The news was there. And from concept to actual, um, the tangible version of the concept being fully functional, it just happened so quick and, and so fluid. You know, that that was, a, that was my introduction to Dave. From us meeting at the game to February 15th, the doors opened at Vector 90. And a couple weeks later, you know, it was entrepreneurs in there, you know, working on ideas and just a synergy of creativity and, um, you know, forward thinking and just a frequency that wasn't in the community before. 
it's, it's alive now. So that was my introduction to today's demonstration. I met him at the game, but from that day to the 15th of February when it was alive, it took form. You know, that process is how me and Dave became business partners. I know that was a long no, answer. No, no, that was good. Let, let me piggyback on that. I think this is important because this is a marketing program. Um, so the, the, the reason why I wanted to work with Nipsey, like I'm sure a lot of you are fans and, and know some of his story, but I was aware of his brand. You know what I mean? I was aware of his brand. So I had been trying to connect with him, and that game was just fortuitous. But the things about his brand that I like, you know, he's an extreme entrepreneur. Like, he you know, built his entire career and brand in his, not just his hometown, but in his neighborhood. And he maintained that, that independence in an era where, you know, it would have been much easier to be an artist assigned to a label to, to blow up and be extreme. Um, and the all money in concept and the hundred dollar mixtape. So all those things, I, I was in New York and I watched from afar. And you know, it just kind of aligned that I was born in South Central, my family's still there and he's from there. But really, if I had to pick somebody in hip hop to like spark this idea, because he's so connected, not just to South Central, but to that collective experience of people in neighborhoods like South Central, it just worked. And so when I was at the game, I was like, hey bro, I've been trying to get at you. We got to do this, just rock with me. And so, literally came the next day, which I didn't, you know, like he said, we were drinking 1942 shots, so it could have just been the game, and it could have just been that talk. But he showed up the next day, and then we started, from, you know, we're here now. But really, it's, it's when, when the people that are going to work on this project with us, like, they have to get a good feel for the brand that he's built over the past, you know, decade to understand why it's an integral part to what we're doing at Vector 90. And then we can explore the Vector 90 brand more throughout the, the process. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Uh, well, first, <coughs> I don't know about you guys, but I don't know how I get Laker tickets sitting next to David Gross <laughs> and Dipsy Hustle. They, they way more expensive now. <laughs> <laughs> they just shot up. We got LeBron. <laughs> but, uh, no, really what I want to ask, kind of building on what we were just talking about, I kind of wanted to ask uh, Nipsey, you know, what's your stance or what's your opinion or perspective about you know, influencers and, and celebrities uh, being involved in more of these social enterprises nowadays? Because you start to see that a lot more. Right. right. Um, I think it's a responsibility to some degree that, you know, when you, when you find yourself in a position of leadership, you have to embrace it. Whether that was your goal to end up being a leader or you, it, just, it just happened to you, I feel like you got to embrace it because it's an upside to it especially artists and athletes or the influencers, you know, you got a lifestyle that's afforded to you, you got all the support. And um, I think that it's just about finding a cause that's, that's true to you. You know, it is something that everybody has, has to do. You know what I mean? If you're, whatever you do, if you're an NBA player, you're an artist, you're a successful entrepreneur, you have to drop a rope. That's what I call it. You got to drop a rope. Once you get up to where you're going, you have to. Just whatever your belief system is, it's just about returning the energy. It's all type of intangible factors that take place between somebody starting off and becoming successful. Certain people that blocked for you, certain people that believed in you, certain people that took a risk on you, for everybody. So you got to pay that forward. You got to be conscious of how you can return the energy. But I think for it to be successful or to make an impact, it got to be in your heart. It got to be something that's, that's true to you. And so, for me, um, I was a young, uh, young man, young teenager, you know, in a, a community where gangs and hustling was the lifestyle. And so, that was the default, you know, uh, lifestyle to embrace. So to be inspired to be an artist or an entrepreneur was a radical decision. And it was against gravity and against the heavy tide in the opposite direction. So I'm, I'm especially empathetic to that feeling, being a young person in that situation where you got talent and you just have no way to articulate or voice it or connect with platforms or you know just shine what, you, what, you, what your gifts are for the world. And so these type of situations, I just have a, a natural 
connection to him because I remember those feelings. I remember really having good intentions and really being honest about I want to do this thing that's really positive and that's a contribution to the world in this area where it wasn't about that and then being frustrated because it's like, damn, you know, you're going to talk crazy and you're going to victim or, you know, demonize these young people when they pick up this lifestyle, but what's the other options? You know, what are y'all doing? You know, so when I see people like Dave and, you know, multiple other programs or just things that have the intention of being a, a resource for a young person in that moment, I'm connected to that. And so I think for everybody, all the influencers, they gotta find what they're connected to, you know? That's important, that's definitely important. Right. I mean, I, to be honest with you, I can somewhat relate, not on the level that you're speaking about, because so I also grew up in a, like a resource challenge uh, neighborhood, and I remember, you know, the point I'm getting at is that sometimes the, the expectations and, and the goals you think you can obtain, sometimes they're, they're, um, they're formulated by your surroundings. Yeah, so sure. when I was growing up in our neighborhood, you know, the people who became very successful, you know, if you were lucky enough to be good at a sport, you might get a college scholarship to play score, sports. But other than that, you know, I remember there was this guy that we thought had the best job in the world. We were like, if we could be like him one day, we're making it. He was a UPS truck driver. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that was kind of like the goal. Like, if I could be a UPS truck driver, I'm making it. So it's good to see people like you coming from those communities and then, and then not only making a way for yourself, but also opening up avenues for other people to make their way as well. So that's some right. cool stuff. Right. And yeah, thank you. <clears throat> a question that other people might have, but I have, that might be interesting to hear about is, of all the ways, because clearly giving back is very important, I completely agree 100%. And I'm curious to know of all the different ways we could give back, why, why a co-working space? Why uh, incubation space? Why Vector 90? Yeah, I'll jump on that first. Um, you know, I've, I spent an entire career on Wall Street. So between school, the undergrad, grad, like two grad schools, then like a decade on Wall Street. So and I came from a very linear path, right? You, you go to a good school to try to get a good job and make money. The world has shifted so much since I went through college. Um, we've, radically, we've radically embraced entrepreneurship and also this gig economy that's kind of evolved. Um, and in some ways I think it's good, in some ways I think people do that of necessity. Um, but to support that, that this new embrace of entrepreneurship and like gigs being things that can turn into businesses, there are ecosystems in a lot of neighborhoods that support that. You know, I mean, the fact that there's, you go to Santa Monica, there's at least eight co-working communities. There's two WeWorks, there's Cross Campus, there's, you know, several. And then there are things that feed into that because you walk out of WeWork, you can go to a Starbucks and take meetings there. You can go get a poke bowl, whatever. All the things that someone on the grind needs to like have a dynamic life and have interactions that support that, they exist in some neighborhoods. Now, if you go to the neighborhood where we created Vector 90, there's a desert of, you know, it's a food desert, it's a coffee shop desert, it's a soul cycle desert. You know, all the things that yeah, I'm gonna go drive Uber, then I'm gonna go work on my, my, my consulting firm or whatever, you're not gonna think to go to, to Compton or Inglewood because the things that, okay, I'm gonna go to, go to the gym, I'm gonna go take this meeting at, at you know, Starbucks, then I'm gonna go to WeWork and work for four hours, then I'm gonna go back and be, like, these sound like they're basic things, but they just don't exist in the place where he grew up, place where I grew up, and, and a lot of communities like that. And then beyond that, you, you get into talking about like sophisticated capital and people who have skill sets that they've worked at startups, they worked at corporates, um, they can talk to you about raising fundi, funding for a business, they're not gonna freak with those neighborhoods. So it, it becomes this world where like, there are virtuous cycles and vicious cycles. You know, so you start having the pieces that create a system, it's a virtuous cycle. You start taking those things away if you never have those things, it's a vicious cycle. Hence, you know, in this moment where I'd say venture capital is kind of ascendant in this country and like Silicon Valley is kind of the, the leading kind of business center in the U.S., it, it just kind of fit. You know, like there are so many entrepreneurs in inner cities by force. Like if you didn't go to college, um, 
if you got, and, and I'll talk to my Nipsey, like I had, I had a little brother who was 24. He had a neck full of tattoos, and I, and I saw him, I was like, bro, there's only a few things you're gonna be able to do in life. <laughs> it's like, you're gonna make it rapping, or you're gonna be an entrepreneur. Um, but where's he gonna get that skill set? So there's so many reasons, but like we have a lot of people in inner cities who you look at them, you think they have a hustle, but you know, the, the gap between a hustle and something that could be a business, you know, it's not that far. Um, you just gotta let them know that it's actually possible. And, and have a place to facilitate it. Yeah. You know, I think <clears throat> to just piggyback on what Dave said, a lot of it is just having a place to set your, your table up and lay a calendar out and, you know, uh, have a, a, a dedicated hour and a half where it's no chaos. It's just all focused energy in this space. And it's five minutes from where you grew up at. It's five minutes from your natural, you know, we, we creatures of habit. So you have a habit in your community. You wake up, might go see your granny, go get you a fruit punch or a donut or something, and then, oh, you can hit Vector 90. You don't have to drive 45 minutes to 30 minutes, you know, or like he said, just take yourself out of a productive um, flow in order to execute an idea, take a meeting, you know, um, do some research. You know what I mean? Put something down on paper. Just all the steps that it takes to just cultivate the ideas into actual movement. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so we um we have this really cool project that our that our kids are gonna I shouldn't call you kids, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> that our students <laughs> are working. Are working on with you guys. So, so initially we were able to reach out to, to, to Dave, and uh, it's a funny story because I had emailed Dave like maybe a week or so before, and, he, and I didn't hear from him. I was like, oh man, you know, I shot my shot, missed or whatnot. And then he, he hit me back and was like, hey, can we meet at 3 p.m. or something like that? But I was in Belgium at the time. Did I tell you that? I was like, I nine hours ahead. I didn't know so it was like midnight. <laughs> so I woke my wife's hiding in the back right there. I told her, I'm like, I woke her up. I'm like, nah, I got to talk to her. <laughs> so I'm like in Belgium, the phone's breaking up. You remember that? It was cutting off. So the day was like, man, maybe we should just meet in person. So then I ended up telling Julie and I, we finally got him to get back to us and, and things like that. So we had this whole pitch put together. And we were going to pitch today, but we got there, and he was already sold. He was so excited about this opportunity. He was pitching us ideas. And we met for like maybe two hours the first, uh, first meeting. Then the next meeting, uh, Nipsey was there. We met probably for another two. I had my little bad kids running around in the background and all that. But we, we ended up with all these super cool, um, great ideas for a group project. So um, maybe this is a good time to kind of speak about, you know, some of the expectations that, um, that you're hoping to see from, from the students and, and some of the results you're hoping to achieve and things like that. And I should also see a lot of note taking at this point from my, my students. That's right. Dr. Lace, you with some game? Now, you know what? For us, it's, um, first of all, sorry it took me a minute to get back to you. And I didn't know I was making my wife up in Belgium. Um, she was eating waffles all day. Nah, <laughs> Ten waffles a day. Nah, for, for, I'm excited. For me, it's an opportunity to have people who, um, people who are probably closer to the, the community I'm trying to target, so like young creatives, entrepreneurs, uh, people who are startup founders, they're, you know, they're not that far from, from like your student's age. Um, a lot of them are, in, actually we have some members who are in college. So having people sit and hear our concept, interpret it, and then come up with, you know, compelling strategies to, to market and promote to help grow um, the Vector90 brand and image and, and having the resources of, you know, an incredible academic institution. You know, it's it's for us. It's a it's a look, as as the kids say. <laughs> I, I think that um, the good thing about and I don't don't nobody be offended if I say beginners are being you know starting off, but I feel like you're not as rigid in in your thought process when when you when you're young and you're not like jaded by, you've been doing this for 15, 20 years, and this is the way that's worked for you. 
sometimes being an expert or being so experienced works against you because you get um, a little bit rigid in your way of thinking because you've succeeded this way and things change and they change so so fast in this generation that to have a resource pool for the young people that's full of new ideas that this y'all era, this is y'all time right now and y'all ideas are the freshest right now, you know, to connect that with an establishment with an experienced, successful investor, entrepreneurs. I think that's just a great combination of, of energies. You know what I mean? Yeah, and it'll, it, it, it's mutually beneficial. Yeah, for sure. You know, because like Dave said, you know, it's a great look for Vector 90 to have all your fresh ideas at our fingertips that we can listen and be like, wow, that's actually something we didn't think of. That's great. And then for y'all, it's, it's such a resource pool that y'all can tap into through Dave, through myself, through everything at Vector 90 that, I mean, the team as well, through the A-list. Um, I think it's just a, a dope intersection. It's natural, and it, it works for everybody involved. Yeah, I, mean, I think there's a confluence of so many things in, in this, like this being a new program. You guys, you know, I got excited when I talked to Mitch when he explained to me who, who he and Julian were. And I was like, okay, it's two black professors. And I actually asked him, like, I, I, he can, this is true. I was like, how, how do you guys have two black marketing, like PhD professors or adjuncts? He was like, no, we're actual doctors. And I was like, how many, how many of you are there? And I think you were like 130, maybe. In the it was less than a less than 150 um, tenured or tenure track African American marketing faculty in the entire country. Yeah. We have <laughs> two. And so I told him I was like, yeah, let's meet in person because I wanted to like see and fill them out. And they came in, and uh, basically they did what they're doing now. Julian was cool and reserved. And Mitchell, and Mitchell was just going. That sounds all right. Mitchell was just going. And um, now I was like, this is going to... So nothing we've done at Vector 90 has been orthodox. Like when I started off talking to existing co-working communities and incubators about, you know, intentionally locating within inner cities, everyone with the best of intentions, like it doesn't really make sense. It's not going to work. There's a reason you don't see me work there. There's a reason you don't see um, spaces or something like that. And I was like, well, that's exactly why I think it will work, you know, because I'm going to go where there isn't a, a lot of supply of office space. Um, there are tons of entrepreneurs. We can undercut the market. Um, and then, like, so, so we're now we're going to get into like the kind of the case aspect of this, you guys can start understanding some of the decisions that were made. Like it was very important for me to have someone who was really connected to the community. So one, they would know it was genuine, and two, from a like if you have a co-working space, you've got to build a community. So if you want to build a community, you know, I got to embrace probably the biggest local hero from South Central, and that that allowed us to forge a partnership with um, the city council that that district eight which is South Central. So then it just began to kind of work. Um, and we started getting buy-in from a lot of people. So nothing we've done has been orthodox. And to speak to, to Nip's statement about having students who haven't been in the workforce working for some big agency to come up with ideas, like, we don't want orthodoxy. Like, I really want you guys to like dig into who he is and what he's built throughout his career and, you know, through Julian and Mitchell, we'll share as much as possible about the Vector 90 business model, the idea we're going to take the concept, and hopefully come up with some really creative and fresh ideas that we can actually execute. Jumping on that, I was wondering if I could hear from the two of you, and it would be interesting to see where there's not overlap on your vision for the brand of Vector 90, specifically in the Crenshaw area. <clears throat> um, you want me to start this? Yeah, so. The, my vision of it and the way I see it is it's a, it's a, a generation of, of people that have, you know, built up potential, built up ideas, built up creativity. And, you know, there's a ton of them in every, every community, but the, the, the area I grew up in, you know, rewind, before I put a song out, before I was ever um, a successful artist. You know, I was a young person from the Crenshaw District, the South Central area. Um, and 
what do you tell that person? What do you tell that young dude? How do you go? How do you get here? You know? How do you? How do you? Like reverse engineer today back to when I'm ten or eleven. What do you tell him? You know? I don't know what to tell him. Honestly, I didn't see. I would just be like, man, just believe and work hard. I don't know. Give you some generic advice. And that's not really good enough, you know? So I think that um, for every example that somebody figured it out and became successful, there's 400, 500 examples where they could have but didn't for whatever reasons. And I think that to have this branded location that has Dave as a face, to have myself as a face, um, you know, if nothing else, my story. And also my, my, my path, you know, is, is a available resource to everybody. You know, my, my experience and the, and the wisdom I've accumulated from bumping my head, as well as Dave. Um, and then, you know, just being able to put enough people in the room and close the door and you set the frequency and say, this is a creative space. This is where we, we think about um, business and we think about progress and we think about creativity and then let nature take its course. You know what I mean? I think that's a big part of the vision, is to facilitate it. And then you let, you know, the, you know, sporadic greatness take, take its own form, however it happens. People bump into each other at the coffee bar, talking, what you doing? Okay, boom, ran into each other in the parking lot. You know, I keep seeing somebody here. It sparks all type of opportunities of, uh, pulling resources and pulling creativity and pulling energy toward progress, toward business, toward um, just creativity, like I said. That's how I see it. You know, I know Dave would probably have his point of view on it. Now, you know what, so sitting in um, the front row right here, two of my community managers, um, and, you know, whenever people come through the space, you know, and they explain what Vector 90 is, like, we forced everyone to like pick up this tagline that it's a cultural, economic, um, what is it, Jay? Oh, wow. <laughs> cultural, <laughs> cultural, economic, work. and intellectual hub. Um, which sounds nebulous and it can sound like bullshit, but that's really what I see it. Like earlier you asked, why would you start with a co-working community? And it's because, um, you know, just having a physical space gives you structure and it makes it's something tangible, right? So if I was, actually, this is, this is a true story. <laughs> like, I spent about four months trying to connect with the city council, um, the District 8 City Council, and I would go to the Destination Crenshaw meetings and say, look, I want to create something that's impactful in the neighborhood um, that just couldn't get any traction. The things that got the traction were, I connected with Nip, and we went back, and then about, two months after connecting with him, or a month after, I signed a lease on the space. And then we went back, and there was a radical shift in how you know, we were perceived because I had an actual space. Now, I think the co-working community incubator is like a foundation, right? But I think it's providing a place where people are gonna come together, like Nipsey said, and you're gonna have you know, all these wonderful like, kind of moments of inspiration and, awa and awareness that just kind of happens. Um, you know, it's kind of like a living laboratory where you, you can chain action and theory. Um, you know, the past three months we've had Shark Tank actually came and you know, they did their casting call for LA for this year from the space. Um, we actually have an incubator, so we have our own incubator, but we have an actual incubator sponsored by the, the city of LA that's taking, that's gonna bring their, their, they haven't had a space, they've had companies they've supported, they're bringing them into our space. Um, we're committed to launching a real estate agency from the space to give entrepreneurs and, and aspiring agents from our community a chance to participate in the upside as, as a lot of people are getting priced out of our community um, and, and dealing with gentrification. Well, we're committed to training and investing in real estate agents in and throughout you know, South Los Angeles. So, it starts to become irresponsible, or I sound crazy if I start saying all the things that it's going to be, but we're starting with something that people can like understand, something discreet um, that's easy to explain, and then we're going to build from there. So, so speaking of Shark Tank, 
part of the project is going to require uh, our students in about a month from now, they're going to come to Vector 90 and they're going to pitch to you and Nipsey some ideas that they think will help achieve some of the objectives that you just spoke about. So in terms of things like, um, so we just did a session on branded content. So in terms of things like content or some type of deliverable, some type of actions and results, uh, you would want to see what are some of the, you know, kind of give the students an idea of what, what some of the winning pitches. So for those of you who may not know, uh, when our students pitch in groups these ideas, Vector90 is actually going to decide to fund each group anywhere from zero dollars <laughs> to an undisclosed amount. We'll figure out later on. <laughs> we're not, not going to do zero dollars. <laughs> <laughs> How, what companies did you have in the past couple years? Uh, so in the past, we worked with the Honest, Jessica, uh, Jessica Alba was the Honest Company. Sure. Um, last semester, we worked with um, a, soul, a vegan soul food cafe, uh, Jackfruit Cafe, owned actually by Angela Lamine. She played uh, Felicia on Friday. Okay. So we worked with her last semester. What's the name of that restaurant? It's called Food Jack, Jackfruit Cafe. Oh, Jackfruit yeah. Cafe. Oh, I got It's good, too. Man. So the idea is that she created like, some food that, look, that looks and tastes like soul food. It's all vegan. But nah, so for us, we're, I mean, there's no benchmark yet because we had these two experiences, but we're looking forward to getting to work. So when they bring, they bring the ideas, we're going like, to let the competition be in the, the results they get after we fund each one of them and see who really drives the results. And then we're going to double down and, and fund that group more. So you're just looking to see what they come up with yeah. first. Okay, cool. Microphone. Um, I have two questions, but I'll start with the more philosophical one. So it's not, I love the idea of creating resources, creating space in a place that desperately needs it to allow a lot of unpredictable things that are good to happen in the space, creative things, right. entrepreneurial things, uh, including the real estate agency. That sounds really cool. A question I have for you, which is a little more philosophical, is why not just make it all nonprofit? So can, I, can I chime in? Go ahead, go ahead. No, that's a great question. I think in reality, and this is, this is kind of on me and Dave, that, you know, sometimes when things need um, to be sustainable, and they, they have, you know, sustainable value to contribute, they, they fall short because of funding. Or they get the faucet cut off after the kids are already engaged or the young people engaged and then the thing is in motion and it falls on its face because it's not, it's not, it wasn't built to be self-sustainable. So when you do a nonprofit, you're relying on every year hustling to keep the donations coming in and keep the funding and keep the grants getting cut. But, you know, if you can create um, a self-sufficient mechanism that, you know, it takes care of its overhead, you know, and, and fuels the mission, but it's, it's built into the infrastructure. It's not something you got to go knock on doors and kiss babies and shake hands. And it's nothing against, you know, philanthropy. I just think it's a, it's a more sustainable model when, you know, there's, a, there's a, some thought behind how we're going to keep these lights on, how we're going to keep the Wi-Fi connected, how we, you know what I mean, how we're going to keep the rent paid. And, you know, Dave and I had the same combo. And, you know, he... He actually made it clear to me that it's, it's, it's a chore and it's a job, you know, to keep donations consistent. You know what I mean? So um, I think that's my phone going off too. My bad. You know? <laughs> my 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 boy over there trying to figure out the code. The code that, that, that long nah, but I, that's my that's my point of view on it. Dave, whatever you, you know. No, that's that's it. Like I didn't. We don't want to create something that was going to exist at the mercy of someone else's charitable like inclinations, right? Like, if I decide there's some great opportunity in Singapore in three or four years and I leave, I don't want to create something that's going to die. Like, if we're not out, you know, passing a half. Um, but but more impressionistic and like, I guess it's kind of it really gets back to the heart of the video we watched at the beginning. There are a couple different economies like within this actual economy. There are investment economies where there, there exists that ecosystem of you know, things that contribute to a robust environment for innovation, entrepreneurs, investment. And there are economies where that doesn't exist. And a lot of those economies are 
kind of grant-driven, philanthropic-driven economies. Um, philanthropic-driven economies. And, and if you go to a lot of inner cities, they are um, driven by, you know, funding from state and city programs um, or well-intentioned, wealthy donors um, to prop up arts, to prop up coding, tech, innovation. That's unsustainable. Like, it's never going to make sense if, you know, there's a really robust world of people getting rich in Silicon Valley in the startup space, and there's, you know, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation funding coding in South Central. What companies are going to go and locate in South Central and get the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates funded coders to come do their work? Mm. Like, there has to be a shift towards an even distribution of, like, sophisticated capital and good ideas like in these areas so for me it was like it was kind of binary like if we're going to do it it's going to be something that can be self-sustainable so like long after Nipsey Hussle like goes on and does something bigger and greater um, we can just hire people to come in and run it <coughs> and it, it exists beyond us like we actually have a nonprofit component to it that's a STEM center because I don't know how to make a profitable STEM center um, and I want to provide a free resource to the kids in the community who can't go to like West Side schools where they have incredible STEM programs. But even that has to come from Vector 90. So from the profits of Vector 90, we will subsidize a STEM center. I've been fortunate, we've been fortunate, once Nipsey got involved, um, we had his album release party at the space. We had NFL players, NBA players saying, everyone hey, will fund the STEM center. But I was like, now we're not taking any funding for the STEM center until Vector 90 is solid so that we don't create this expectation in the neighborhood that this is going to be here, your kids can come and use it, and then if the business isn't sustainable, it goes away. Because that, I have so many memories of that. When I was a kid, things that were good and things that were there, like funding got cut, the director moved, and then it just was no more. Mm -hmm. So whatever we do, you know, we're committed to establishing it on a very solid foundation so it can grow and it can be replicated. And that's a very important part of this from a marketing standpoint for the people that are going to work on this program. Um, we already have partners lined up in other cities who want to, you know, we have a partner from Baltimore, we have partners from Baltimore, we have partners from the Bronx, we have partners from Miami who are local heroes who want to fund it. But it's so important for us to get, like, you know, South Central is, you know, ground zero for this concept. It has to be a super solid foundation. So the, the things that your, your students are actually going to do is going to be critical to our next, you know, 12 to 18 months. Man, great, great, great answers. Yeah. Do you guys mind if we take this time to kind of open it up to the students that maybe maybe ask a couple questions here or there? Uh, maybe we should start. Can we start with, do we have any of our A-list students since you guys are working on the projects? Do you guys have any questions? We can kind of start there, and then we can open it up to the, uh, to the larger audience. We have a wireless mic that we'll pass around, so if you have a question, from, we'll start with the A-list students. Who has, the, who has that mic? No? Yes. Uh, okay. You can, can just yell, you can yell it out. They'll just yell it out. Kat, you're going to ask a question? Go ahead and stand up, though. <laughs> Represent A-list and stand up with confidence. Oh, wait, do I introduce myself? Okay. Introduce well, yourself. <laughs> um, so I'm Catherine, I'm a junior marketing major, and um, I actually had a question for Nipsey, because you mentioned one time in an interview that um, and you have to be comfortable with what you have in order to be able to progress forward, but then when you're comfortable with what you have and like working with what you have, how do you balance staying hungry with that while being able to live in appreciating the process? Um... I mean, I don't know if you're going to like it. I don't know if we like it when we're in them moments, but I think you have to be willing to, you know, embrace the moment. We, we are where we are. You know, we find ourselves at this moment in time right now. And so we we doing better than some, worse than others. We, we might be further than we were a year ago, but not necessarily where we want to be just yet. So I think that if it's like a set destination or a set amount of money or a set level of accolade that you or any of us are waiting on to be working on all 12 cylinders or to be 
passionate about showing up every day or to be inspired with what we're doing. It's not, it doesn't happen like that. We gotta be inspired with the, what's today's job? We gonna, we gonna attack this and we gonna treat this like, you know, this is the finals or this is the moment we waiting on, you know? So I think that it's wisdom that you get from going on your path. You know, you, you, you learn the nuances and the intangibles of your profession. And for, in my experience, you know, making it about the money or the fame or the celebration, you learn through the process that that, that prevents you from, from really experiencing the good shit. You know what I'm saying? The good shit is, we in college, I can say shit, I'm sure. Uh, you know what I'm saying? So the good, the good stuff is the, the, what, you, what you accumulate on the mission. This is what informs you. And this is why some people could fall off or have a bad year or lose it and get it back because they went through the process. You know what I mean? So I think that, um, and I'm gonna say this also, you know, what, what I've experienced is I didn't think big enough. I made lists that I thought was gonna take me my whole life. You know what I mean? I made a bucket list that I thought I wouldn't accomplish till I was 85 years old. And then you look up and it's all checked off one day. And you're like, damn, it's kind of scary that you kind of you did everything you, you set out to do, but then you realize I should have set a big, I should have set a goal that was just completely unbelievable to me because you mess around and actually accomplish it. And um, the moment when you look at your list and everything's done, it's a, it's a, it's a cross, I mean, a, a fork in the road. It's just where you say, all right, I've learned from this last process that what I, what I envision now is possible and impossible. One day, this might seem like something small because I know back when I was visualizing where I'm at today, this seemed like the end all. I remember thinking about a million dollars, like, wow, get a million dollars, this is set for life, you rich. <laughs> and, you know, being able to see what that feel like and, and, and experience that and, and learn the reality of that, it's about, you know, you think about a hundred million after that, you think about a billion after that because, you know, it's just your, your collective experience is, is based on, you know, what, you, what you've done and been through. And your expectation is a little bit based on what you've seen and what you've been through. So I don't mean to go too far away from what you asked, but I think it's just about embracing the process, being confident that if you lay a brick a day, eventually you're gonna have a brick wall. You know what I mean? Instead of trying to set out to build the Great Wall of China, just we trying to be consistent on a daily basis and make progress and set tangible goals. You know what I mean? And um. Nothing beats sticking to the script. I, it's, I don't, I've never seen no cheat code. I've never seen no um, magic tricks. I just seen consistency, hard work, and showing up every day and becoming a force and getting the momentum behind you. You know, in my experience. I hope that answered what you got. Uh, Thank you. Great, yeah. great answer. You should have seen Dave Shake when you were like a million dollars. Dave was like a million dollars. Oh, yeah, you know. <laughs> you know how you know. <laughs> Anybody else have a question? Well, where's our runner at? So we, if we could use that mic, we can turn off one of the other Oh. Here, scream okay. it out. I'll repeat the question. I did a bad job with that last one. So you want to just pick them up? Yeah. Okay. So my name is Kaylin. I'm a senior communication studies and African American studies double major. Um, but my question is, like, y'all talked a bit about like entrepreneurship out of necessity. And recently I heard that like, So I want to ask y'all, like, how do you recommend that young black creatives and entrepreneurs like safeguard our ideas and our futures as we try to get ourselves established? The question was, how do young entrepreneurs of color, young black entrepreneurs and creatives safeguard their ideas as we get established? That's a good question. I'll take a stab at it first. <laughs> I'll take a stab at it first. You know, let, uh, I want to hear. I got, I got an opinion, but I'm just glad to say. No, but I think one of the, um, I think one of the ways you safeguard your creativity and your ideas and, and your, um, 
that the, kind of that magic is you have to create something real and execute. Um, not to, I'm going to do something I probably shouldn't do up here, but I'm going to call out a very specific brand or company. Not that I have an issue with, but it's always kind of uh, puzzling to me. So Complex is a very established media brand um, that kind of writes about music, culture, fashion, and tells people, you know, from South Central, from Baltimore, from the Bronx, what's popping in music, what's popping in fashion, what's popping in sneakers. And I'm always kind of confused by, like, the audience you're speaking to and the people doing the speaking, there's a disconnect. But it's, I can't fault Complex because, you know, there was some kid who was interested in music and speakers, and he was like, we're gonna start this website. And like Nip said, we're gonna lay a brick a day, and we're gonna be consistent. And they went from being, you know, a website to a network that owns websites. And there were kids who, who there were kids in the Bronx, kids in Harlem, kids in South Central who knew sneakers, who knew music, who could have gone and built a website, they didn't do it. And now they're reading Complex, to have Complex tell them, here's the music you should like. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's, so if you want to safeguard that idea, execute an idea, go and do it. Um, and, and you know, we're trying to do our part so that some of the inputs are there that normally wouldn't be there. But yeah, I think uh, one of the, the, the great levelers is action. I agree. Um, <clears throat> I think what I, what I experienced too was that I had two jobs and I didn't know I had two jobs. I was playing two sports, I didn't know I was playing two sports. And I don't mean that literally, I just mean there was no institution or infrastructure built to foster my creativity. So I'm an artist primarily, but I didn't have no studio. So I became a studio builder and I became an engineer because there was no budget to pay for the engineer. But that's not the job of the artist. And you know, there was, there was after there was a studio and I learned how to record myself. Then I had to write the rapid performance also, go back to the artist mode. And I used to get frustrated from that, like, and have a little bit of a victim mentality, like, man, it's too much, I gotta do all this, I gotta be my own record label, be my own studio, be my own manager, be my own artist. But from necessity, you know, it, it, in hindsight, I built an infrastructure and I built an institution that I could rely on myself. And what happened, uh, just by the way the cards fell, was that I was able to own the content that I created. Because I didn't go get a deal. And I didn't go to an established operation. I built the operation. It was a rinky-dink shoestring budget to begin with. But we were capable of producing. And to have the means to produce was something I stumbled into out of necessity. And the job that, whatever the title would be, would not be artist. That's more like an executive role or um, a construction to actually build a studio, to build, to educate myself on what is the record label? What is the, this business that facilitates the release of music? What are the departments? What does each department do? How do they all work together? What does the executive level do? It's out of necessity. I didn't really have a passion for that like I did for music. I didn't get the same feeling I get when I make a song that I got when I put the cable in the back of the computer. And you know what I mean? Got the Pro Tools up and running. I didn't get the same feeling, but it became, y'all not finna stop me. This not gonna be the reason I don't get nothing done. And then I might be running back and forth from the mic to the Pro Tools and pressing stop. But all right, I got more fire in me now. I got a bigger chip on my shoulder because I'm doing five jobs. And I'm not, I'm not giving this up cheap because of that. You know what I mean? So I think I almost forgot the question. But <laughs> I, knew, I knew I was bringing it. But you answered but the question. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm bringing it back home, I think. Um, you said about. How do you protect How do you protect your ideas? There we go. I think you, you it's yours till you give it away. It's yours. Until I sign the contract, I'm, I'm my own boss. I own all the masters. I own 100% of Nipsey until I give it away. And why, why do I feel the need to give it away? That's another question. Because it's, not, it's nothing built for me to keep it. I gotta go play ball on their court. So if I'm gonna you know, prevent the, the asset from being leveraged, 
I got to create my own court. And I got to be willing to go the long way. And I got to be willing to take a little bit longer. My whole brand is called the marathon. You know what I mean? Do I need to explain that? Uh, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But I think that's a, that's a great question. And that's what defines you. Is you got, in my opinion, and this is my humble opinion, two type of people. One that's going to not take no for an answer, and one that's going to find an excuse. And that'll be the difference. You're going to figure it out. You know what I'm saying? You're going to go crazy, bump your head. Going crazy is a real part of this, by the way. If you ain't going crazy, you're probably not on the path. You don't feel your sanity getting tested. You're probably not really in the kitchen for real. You, you start feeling crazy, you might be getting close. You know what I mean? Yeah. Thank you. You know Question was: Was there a moment in your paths where some of your ambitions started to come to fruition, and you kind of realized that this could actually happen? And how did you feel about that? Yeah, I'll take a stab, and then we'll hear more from Nipsey because his his highs have probably been crazier. I don't know, man. I don't know. He's doing a lot. <laughs> nah, so I'll just give a little context for it. So I was the first person in my family to do everything, like to you know go to college, to not go to jail. To you know, get in. Not that. To have a you know a real job, and then all those firsts they were pretty significant. Like I went to Cornell. I worked at a bank called Goldman Sachs. Um, but I'd say the one moment that I had where I was like, all right, you know, I need to kind of reorient. Um, what I think winning is, you know, I was I was actually in in Singapore, like I was in Singapore, um, I lived there for like seven months. I was living at the, the Ritz, um, and I was running a business. That was a in flex, Singapore. by the way. <laughs> no, bro, no, I'm saying it because I'm never in life. Never yeah. No, no, so look, I'm, I'm setting, I'm giving you the picture, I'm giving you the picture. I never, I never would have thought about going to Singapore. I never would have thought about going to Singapore. I, ne I, I never imagined going there. I definitely never envisioned living at the, the Ritz, you know, for a long time. Seven months. Running a business. <laughs> um, yeah, and I was there and I was like, I kind of got to start over. It's kind of like Nipsey said, you, you set some goals for yourself. And it was, I never had a number in my head, but it was just experiences that I had. And then, I, here's what I added, right? So, there are a lot of reasons I had up until that moment or at any point in my life where I, if I had tapped out or quit, I could have been like, well, I never had this, I never had that. And then it got to a point where I went through all these things. I was like, well, well shit, no one else in my family went to college, but I actually did go to Cornell. No one else ever had a career, but I did work in Goldman Sachs. So like all those things that at, some, at, at one point I could have used as reasons why I failed or didn't try, those weren't excuses for me anymore. So if you're at some crossroads or you're thinking about stuff and if you're at a place where like you, you've accomplished a bunch of stuff, like, it's a, there can be some angst around that, but if you, you're at a place where you've moved through a lot of things you thought you could move through, any excuses you had that might have stopped you from getting here, they're not there anymore. You know what I mean? Like, now it's like, you have to go out and do something better. You have to find a new, a new goal. You have to set some new ambitions because all those things that could have stopped you from getting here, clearly they didn't. And so you, you've gone further than someone else, wherever you came from, than they did. So it's almost like an obligation. I wish I realized that when I was in college. <laughs> it took me a lot longer than that. Other questions, especially specifically ones from the Rethink in the Workplace class. Hello. Um, my name is Eric Tanny Khan. I'm the founder and CEO and head chef of Dessert, where one fight will change your life. <laughs> 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 
Conversations that um, Dad was talking earlier about the city council meetings that we was going to early. That was the main combo because it's in motion. When that type of development happens, I don't know the specific stat, but the value of property goes up and the rent follows the value of property. So that means if you're a property owner, you make money. If you somebody that's renting, you end up getting a, a raise on your rent and you might have to move. And that's, that happens traditionally in all the communities where these developments take place. So, in a way, there's a, there's a talent pool in every community. There's, there's a resource pool, which are the people. And, you know, there's also a, um, a amount of capital that these people have to work with. And if somebody had a concept for a restaurant, a coffee shop, um, a startup of some sort, and they from this area, they probably conscious of what's going on. They probably conscious that if they can get in one of these vacant buildings or one of these homes or one of these storefronts with their idea, they could benefit from the development. But it's a gap because you need resources, you need money, you need training, you need a plan. And so I think that Vector 90 Number one, being there, having the doors open and the facility built, and also there being a campaign behind spreading the idea. You know, I don't know how you heard about Vector 90. Y'all assume it was through content, though, right? Yeah, yeah. I was watching some of your videos, man. <clears throat> yeah, so an interview or the piece that y'all seen earlier um, is, is the, the bat signal going up for all the creators, all the entrepreneurs, everybody that has a, a vision. And Vector 90 is the space to come get your pen and your pad and start working because it's a window for the opportunity in the area. If you're going to sit there and complain, I mean, the bottom line is you're just going to be sitting there complaining. It's done. The, 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 the ink is dry. The paperwork is signed. The train going to be built. The development is in motion. So you can be proactive. You can be effective or you can be symbolic and just say, we don't like this. And it, it's not good, this is true, but what is there to do? Put your entrepreneur hat on. And, and I'll, I'll address it um, slightly differently. And it might not be the most satisfying answer given, given the question you asked. But um, if the Destination Crenshaw redevelopment and project is as successful as you know the city hopes it will be and the community wants it to be, yeah, it's, the demographic of Vector 90 probably isn't gonna be the same 10 years from now. Um, we will be serving whatever the local population is. We're not going to turn people away. Um, hopefully what, what our presence in the Crenshaw District over the next 10 years does is it teaches some people who otherwise wouldn't have known how to benefit and to change the neighborhood. Um, but beyond that, you know, I'm targeting, like from, from the very start of this process, I could have gone to West Adams and I could have said I'm checking the box being in South Central. Um, but I'm really serving USC students, so that's what we're going to do. But clearly, that's not, you know, where our hearts are. Um, we wanted to go and target people that are, are definitely underrepresented, who don't get resources um, provided, who don't get that look. So it's unfortunate to say if if Crenshaw changes, there are other inner cities who will be will be you know pursuing the same mission. I mean, that's the whole point of this. We want to do something that's replicable. Uh, we actually have a list of probably 40 inner cities um, that at some point can really benefit from this. So, you know, I hope Crenshaw changes. I hope the people that currently live in Crenshaw benefit from that change. But um, if it does change the point that we're not considering an inner city 10 years from now, you know, we'll be in Jackson, Mississippi. We'll be somewhere else where there is that need. Right. Can, I, can I add some of that real quick, too? I think also, you know, if you think about Silicon Valley, and 
what's going on and what has happened up there. I don't know which came first. Was it all of the companies being there or was it the culture of creatives in that garage? You know what I mean? A culture existed first and then the the thing that Silicon Valley turned into followed. So the back to the 90s, actually creating a culture of entrepreneurship and a culture of being proactive in a community where that culture doesn't exist. And from there, everybody who downloads the culture will walk into their respective path and, you know, they'll walk it and they'll live it. I think that's powerful because you got to think about why, and I'm going to be blunt, we all, I don't know if everybody from LA, everybody from somewhere, but every community has a culture that exists. LA got gang culture. This is why if you leave a little a young person unattended to, there's a, there's a strong pull when they go outside and they can be pulled into this. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's a very magnetic force. So, you know, I'm, I'm very aware of how important and how powerful mindsets and cultures can be. So as, as effective as a negative culture can be, a positive culture can be as effective and have the same pull on a person. So to create a culture of, hey, look, it's a, it's a place you can go. And, you know, you can have these access to, the, to these resources and these people in this way of thinking. It's just a different, you know, character to, to embrace for young people in the area. And then you got Dave leading the, the, the messaging and you got Nipsey also leading the messaging. You know, I think that's really important. Yeah. Awesome question. I think we, considering the time, have time for about one more burning question. I can't pick. You guys. She's burning. She has the All right. Never mind. I don't need it. Okay. Hi. My name Oh, that's your uncle Brock. That's my, uncle, that's yeah. my guy. <laughs> so, my Rocky out there balling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So my question is, kind of piggybacking on what he said, like why stop in Crenshaw? How can I, as a student, help my country? You know, because I have a lot of pride for Asmara and I want us to continue to do well. So how can something like this be like connected or bridged over to our country? Like why stop in the United States? You know, I don't think the plan is to honestly. I think that when you think about Asmara. It's a similar opportunity as South Central LA. It's a, it's a you know, uh, opportunity zone. It's an undeveloped location with, with the, as many geniuses as San Paulo or Silicon Valley, as many creatives as Soho, as many creatives as West Hollywood or Santa Monica. It just hasn't been built to facilitate the, the creativity. So the opportunity that exists in South Central LA, that exists in Baltimore, that exists in the Bronx and Philly, exists in Africa also. You know, I think that us being feet on the ground here, families here, roots here, relationships here, it's gonna start here. But you know, we saw we saw hip hop culture go global. Period. You know what I'm saying? In our lifetime. So we we know that. Great ideas can cross oceans, you know what I'm saying, without the same restrictions that people have, you know? So, just to answer the question, I don't think that the, the vision stops in America. I just think that's step one, you know what I mean? So, before we uh, wrap up, I wanted to give you guys a chance, if we could start with Dave, if you had any last, you know, things you wanted to put out there to make sure people took away from this session. If not, that's cool, too. Nah, so all the students who are going to be working on this, I think it's important that they actually come in and see the space and connect to the space. So for the life of this program, all the students in, we think, in the marketplace, we want to give them um, memberships to Vector 90. So they can, if they're really going to create a marketing and branding program for it, they have to come tap in. Um, so did you guys, wait, 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 I don't, maybe they didn't hear that. You want to say that again? I feel like some of the Rethink in the Marketplace students didn't hear that. No, nah, so all the, all the students that are actually in your classes that are in the, in the Rethink in the Marketplace class that are going to come and work on branding and PR for Vector90, um, we're going to give them memberships to Vector90. Um, so, so actually 
they, they don't have to do it now. We brought our two community managers so they can take information and kind of connect with people and sign them up. Um, you know, I think for the, the classes that are working on this, this is the beginning of the conversation so they can really fill the brand. I'm gonna stick around for like 15 minutes to, to answer like specific questions kids have about it. Um, but now I really appreciate the time. Thank you everybody for coming out. A um, couple things. I think everybody at some point, y'all should go to Vector90.com and just see what the space looks like since, you know, y'all have been given memberships. You know what I mean? And it's a dope space. It's, it's, a, it's a really creative vibe. You automatically walk in and get inspired. Um, and outside of that, you know, thank y'all for giving us y'all ears. I look forward to hearing everybody's ideas in the future. Um, Keep going hard. I see all y'all at the top. Uh, hey, are we invited back? Are we invited back? Are we invited back? Oh man, you can invite back anytime you want. All right, all right. Say that. Say that. <laughs> I got some thank you gifts. I'm gonna grab them real quick. Oh, you got thank you gifts? Uh, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> hey.